Ash County Oral History Project, an interview with Herbert and Annie Green, September the 15th, 1981. Interviewer Clarice Weaver and Ruth Dashman. Now, I think we, we got to Chicago when you were trying to hold on to your place. Good, uh, to the gate. Yeah, uh-huh. So when they opened it, when they got the servicemen loaded, they announced they had 13 seats. Well, when they swung that on, open, well, naturally, I went too first. <laughs> so, I got a seat, but it was in an old coat. They were pulling some good ones, but it was an old one. I think it was one that pulled up and down the river here. Mm-hmm. Could have been. And I rode that, uh, well, I got off at Oakland, California. That's Oops. just on this side of the bay, you know. And uh, Bland's partners there and met me. At Oakland. At Oakland. So we went up there and went over to see him the next morning. And they had got a hold of this penicillin. Mm-hmm. This doctor was from Philadelphia and had a pool with, uh, with the government. And no civilian had never had it in his just for the serviceman, you know. Mm-hmm. So he got in with them to let him try it on him because there'd been hundreds of them died with that same thing. Uh, this year he called them bugs that settled on this heart valve and they multiplied till they got so many of them, he said, till they couldn't hold on and they all just turned loose. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the blood carried it all over you. And your face looked just like it's covered up in blood bust. It done the same thing to your brain. You just went haywire. Hmm. So they had got a hold of that. She took me about four or five days to get out there. And they thought he had spinal meningitis, I believe. And they'd put him in the isolated department, you know. But he had, he had, they'd got this and he said, had come, he'd come to his cell. But you couldn't, you couldn't go in the room. You had to, you could talk by talking loud, hear each other. And this doctor, he said that uh, they just had visiting hours Wednesday and Sunday evening. And this doctor went down to the office and got me a pass, and I could go at 9 o'clock and stay till 10. But I never was in the room where he was at but one time, and the doctor had him to... He said, that's just too far to come to he was going to come back with me. But when they checked him, at the end of the ten days, why, there's still some of that in his blood and they had to, had to treat him another ten days. Mm-hmm. But this penicillin took mm-hmm. care of it. Yeah. But how long did he live after that? Oh, he come back and had another. He had another spell and went to Winston-Salem. And he stayed a day longer at one place than he did the other. I could just wish. I guess they're all eat up. I don't know that. And he's doing, and he. He's the one that started and put up this uh, ready mix thing and died before he got it all to go on. And no, no, I guess you know her. Uh, she got me to come and help her cut this thing to go in and want me to put in a sand mulch. What sand was? It's the, gr- it's the green t- ready mix out here. Yeah, and that's when I told my mother. That knocked um, me out for three years. Is that what happened? You, you mean you sawmilled and all that very dangerous work? and? 
Then got your arm hurting the. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, my. You know what I remember? You know what George told me? You just about lost the use of it, didn't you? Yeah. But you get it hung in a machine. Get it hung in a conveyor belt, cleaning the sand off of it. You had to have a lot of surgery, did you? They operated on Dr. Jones operated on first. Picked it back. And you see, I got sewed up with a circle saw once. And he, he told my wife that uh, if I got out in six weeks, I'd do well. The sixth morning, I asked him if I'd go home. He looked at me and grinned. I wasn't very well acquainted with him then. He says, yes, we can get out of there. And this went on over. And Bland come in. Your ball. Yeah, that's the one that's in California. About that time, and I said, Bland, go home and get my clothes. And the doc said I'd go home. He says, oh, he never done it. I said, yes, he did. You go and get him. And he went on up the hall and over tucked off. He was making his round through the hospital. And asked him, he says, yeah, I told him that. He says, he can't get out of that. I was in the bed, you know, hit me in the hip, too. The circle saw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, he come back. He says, you don't mean you're going home? I said, yeah, I'm going home. Well, he says, I'm going to take them stitches out. I forget how many is in the way up there. Honey, can you read this at all? She said it. So, so I went home and I was building my house up on the river. You know where it is? Yes, uh -huh, I do. Well, I got to hopping around and sealing closets and messing. And then this, this as soon as I got to like it woke a bit, I bought me a jeep. <laughs> and to go to the sawmill, I went to the sawmill again. Oh, really? So you and it, when it healed up, you put your fist in the hole in my head. Right. At the circle saw me? What'd you, what'd you fall into it? A uh, log knocked me into it. Mm. I guess you were lucky to come out of that alive, weren't you? Pretty close to doing it. I went right out over the top of the saw and I seen it going to hit me in the face. I threw my head back and pulled my arm up out when that saw went right through here and it caught me. Hit. And I fell on my hand and I jerked loose again and went plumb on across the track and still fell on my stomach again over that. They carried all the slabs out. And I looked back at that place and Lord, tore all the pieces and it looked worse, you know. Then, and I think to myself, uh, You can't talk and eat stuff. Yeah, if I can. If I can walk, I ain't killed. <laughs> I got up, man, uh, how I got back across that track, I don't know, but I did. And went back up and went around this old log that knocked me in and to where the fella, I helped roll the log that knocked me. And he hadn't moved and said, Lord, I must says you cut all pieces. Got to get you out of here, get on my back, and after I crawled up on his back, but he didn't go. But just a little ways, it's awful steep. And we'd walk over in there, it's raining, wet. And, and I said, Bill, lay me down here and, and get a board. And I'll get on the board, and all three, there's just three of them with me. And I says, and carry me like you're carrying a cross tie. And they went down there and got a, an old ice board about 11 inches wide, inch and a half thick, 
We'd more than I did. And plenty of dry stuff down there. <laughs> We've been trying to sell some chestnuts. <laughs> but they sent me down one time. How far did they have to carry you? Oh, I'd say right at three quarters of a mile. And you bleed? And then the lady, no, it didn't bleed, but it's oh. bled enough. I was laying on my stomach, see, and it just bled oh, yeah. enough to run under me a little bit. Oh, my. I know they were scared. Yeah, they hadn't been. They couldn't have come out of that like they did me. They set me down one time to see if it was bleeding so all this sitting down. Those, I don't think about sawmill accidents and things like that. They're always so far back from a, the doctor or anything, aren't they? Yeah. A sawmill. It is dangerous. But this year, one of these fellows, what he'd done in the Army was pick up the wound. Oh. And he just had to come back. From the so he's out of well. and he's rough out of there with something. Yeah. He, he just laid me right across the the back of the truck. You no, know, it was just a lumber truck. He just laid me across the way back there. He drove out of there just like he's sober. He didn't take off his been a lot of fellas as a kid as you get now. He used his head, didn't he? Yeah. Well, that was a close call, I'm sure. And then you had your other close call with your arms. Is that your major accident? It's the only two big ones you've ever had. Yeah. That was about enough, wasn't it? Oh, well, of course, uh, Doc Jones operated on me one time, twice in one week. I was up pretty sick. Oh, and so, see, we had the starch, and I still iron every piece I wash, and Ruth fusses at me all the time over that, but see, I've never known nothing else. No, no. Well, now, your mama, now how many children, there's, uh, you, you had one, a little one to die, mm-hmm. but you yeah, raised more. ten to, to be grown. Through the uh, house. How in the world did you... Now, you didn't have electricity when they were little. Uh-uh. Oil, kerosene lamps. Yeah. How did, how did you how did you cook and wash and iron? You want to come over here and sit down and talk a little about your washing and ironing for your big family? Well, we washed... Had a wood stove. Washed outdoors when we could and boiled in a black pot. Or in, you didn't you know, even have Clorox then. <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> Later years we had the Clorox. But I made Lyso. Did you make Lyso? And uh, used uh, Lyso, you know, all we could. It bleached them, didn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. And uh, boil them in lye. And wash diapers every day. You know, just wash all Did the time. Did you have... Some woman help you, or did yeah, you? Yeah, they was a, they was a woman that uh, helped do the washing. Come uh, come every Monday if it wasn't so bad, she couldn't get there. Well, you had to, didn't you, with those? And ones? then I washed in between there, uh-huh. and always after they got big enough to iron, they done the ironing. And We're talking everything about they could do. And speaking of ironing, did you iron everything? Your sheet. Yes, <laughs> iron the, mostly iron the sheets and pillowcases starched and iron just as slick as a ribbon. And another thing. Your, your husband's t- uh, overalls. Overalls. He starched them too? Starched them and ironed them. If I wasn't sewing in white pine, if we did, but we let them go. Yeah. Because they just slick over. And that there. Uh, Rose them, it'll eat the overhauls up, and the first thing you know, they'll start ripping Slitting, you. Know. you know. Mm-hmm. So but you then know. you could buy overalls for 48 cents a pair. 48? Couldn't. Yeah, you get them down at Smith, the Goodwill uh, store. J.C. Penny. Mm-hmm. For 48 cents. And buy a 100 pound bag of sugar for less than $5 off your watch. <laughs> And 
Oh, we never slept on a plain pillowcase. There was always embroidery on the pillowcase. Never have I ever went to bed in a plain pillowcase. Well, did you do your embroidery? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did the embroidery. Oh, now, um, how in the world did women have the time to quilt and embroider and all that stuff? Do you know how you did it? Oh, no, I do not. I don't know it. And um, I made their little shirts and uh, aprons that they wore for every day. And canned? I bet you did your canning. Canned and preserved and scrubbed and painted the house inside and dried apples, dried apples and beans. And Go to Wilkes and pick blackberries. How did you do? Go to Wilkes and pick blackberries and climb the mountains and hunt strawberries. Well, while part of them went, the other part of us was doing whatever they were doing. They were working. We had different jobs. Everybody pitched in, didn't they? Uh -huh. I've wondered what, what happened when there was a lazy woman. If some poor man married a lazy woman, <laughs> what did he do? Honey, they have to tell their tale. We don't tale. know nothing about that. <laughs> I've never heard of a lazy woman in Ash County. <laughs> Well, our way. neighbors was always just like me, and my friends was always just like me. They was just at work at something all the time. And we gathered some herbs, picked clover blossoms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What'd you do with them? Sold them, dried them. They, they bought them at the local store. Yeah, they bought them, you know. Gathered mint. The other thing I wanted to ask about is it seems to me that that Every week the shoes had to be shined for Sunday. Oh yes, the shoes on Monday morning, they had to be uh, washed and set out on a long shelf across the porch and dried and then every one of them shoes polished and about as a half to case why but mine always had two or three pair of shoes. They we had lucky. a Sunday car, but they, we never wore them on Monday, no, unless the funeral or Unless it was to go place, you and know. And you took care of those Sunday mm -hmm. shoes, that's for sure. Uh -huh. But then, see, on, on Monday, the, all the shoes had to be cleaned for the next Sunday, right? Uh -huh. Can't you just see uh -huh. that line of shoes lined up all of them? And they, the little girls always wore bows on their hair, hair, hair bows in their hair. And so we didn't have a car back then, and... I know Gwen S. said it always amazed her to get to church before we did and watch us all roll out that lumber truck. She never could figure out how <laughs> that many youngins could get out of one cab with the truck. And one. said every one of us had a hair bow in our hair. All the little girls had hair bows that mother put in our hair. One time we was going up Gap Creek and we met some fine looking car. James, you know him, I guess. I know him. Well, they've got his name there. And the young one had the cab plumb full, and James, he's standing up on the floor, looking out the windshield. Says, Daddy, who was that? I says, I don't know who it was. I said, some big shot. He says, I'm a little shot now, but someday I'm going to be a big shot. <laughs> he's done all right. Well, you know, uh, uh, I, I grew up, here in the mountains too, you see, in, in Ash County, and I know we had a, a, a pretty big sized family. But I think manners and and that sort of thing was more important then than they are now. Uh, because we were told what to do, and it was mannerly to say yes ma'am and no ma'am. And when we went to, we had our son to go to meet in shoes too. and. Uh, when we got home, we took them off, and we took our Sunday dress off, too. Well, how did your daddy get along through the panic of sawmill? <laughs> did he lose everything he uh, had? No, no, he didn't, as a matter of fact. Um, I don't remember that much about it, but I remember hearing him talk about it. I was the third one down in the family. Uh, he was laid off. He was working in West Virginia, and he was laid off from his job. And at that time, they... He wasn't a bun and... No, he was, he was, he worked for this big company. Mm. I forget which, which one it was. Maybe he was a, sometimes he'd have to go out and buy, and sometimes he was a superintendent of the, of the foreman of the job. Yeah. But the thing closed down, and I've heard him say, 
he run out of money and they had to, at the local store he was able to get uh, credit not everyone was but because he had a job coming back to him as soon as it opened up but he said at the last he was just ready to throw in the towel they had to, they brought flour and stuff around the I don't know the what was it called? It wasn't the WPA. What was it? Come on. Whatever it was, they brought it around and, and you had to go sign up and tell your story, you know, and they'd give you some flour. Yeah, I remember that. Too. And he said he was just started to go over and sign up because he just didn't see how he could ever come out of it. And he uh, got the mail first. And in, in the mail was his call to come back to work. <laughs> but... That's that's how low it he got. Well, we well, lucky enough I, never to have to get a. I bought a boundary timber just before. Bag of that. Enough. We didn't need it. Come in and put eight hundred dollars of money I had in the old for the my place on the river. And before I got started in there, I had to borrow five hundred more. And I worked a year. <laughs> And it just got worse and worse. And when I come out of there, I owed that to five hundred dollars. My eight hundred was gone. And I don't know how many owns I had. Four, five, six, wasn't it? Well, I guess I don't know. That's two years apart. <laughs> and well, it looked pretty blue, and my truck tires wore out. My old truck nearly tore up. My ro logging rig was. Well, you know, when you ain't got the money, you let things run down. You have to. And I was down at North Wilkesboro. I was a finishing up, and S.P. Thompson told me, asked me if I was going to make any money on my job. He's all the time talking to me after he had that guy taking up ties for him. And I'd, I'd been told that if you give this guy a couple of dollars or, or take him a pint of whiskey, you get a better grade and naturally come off somebody else. <laughs> so I went down there one Saturday morning, I got up four daylights home and I looked me a little tired and took him down there. Man, he gave me a mean grade. I never said nothing, I just took my ticket and I went back, picked me out a load of number five. Wire and no bad knot or nothing there. I come down there and, well, I had one or two threes and some fours and the rest of them five. I went up to the office, took my check. Mr. Sebastian was the bookkeeper up there. He wrote my check and looked at that. I said, Mr. Sebastian, that ain't right. I said, what? She said, according to them tickets. I says, I guess it was. But I says, the worst thing about it, I says, them tickets wasn't right. He says, how do you know they was? And I says, because I come down here this morning and I got a mean grade on that first load. But I says, I didn't grade them nor set them down. I just rolled them off as that guy. But I says, uh, when I went back, I got me a load of number fives, and they're number fives, and I'm going to have the money for them. And Mr. Thompson, that's the guy that owned the place. I guess you hear yeah, that. Yeah, I sure have. He come around on what the trouble was, and I told him. And I says, now, Mr. Thompson, I ain't got any two dollars, and I ain't a giving that man a pint of whiskey to get a good grade. I says, I don't do stuff like that. And he said, says, Mr. Baston says, write him a check for number five, them loads of tight. Oh, I says, no, I don't want to tell you. I says, I never grade them others. And after that, when I was down there, he always would come out and talk. He'd talk for 30 minutes. And 
and he's out there and you know guys are getting about done and things is getting rough you couldn't sell nothing and I don't know if I was going to make any money and I said no I if I get out of there and this lose 800 I put in it and the five I borrowed I'm going to do well and he looked at me and laughed and he said well, he says, it's rough. He says, I've tried it. He says, I come here and worked on the railroad section. Got a little money and got to buying produce and shipping it to spread. And decided to I'd buy me a carload, but I had to borrow some money. And he says, I shipped it to Baltimore and says, I bought them, fell out of that. Oh, my. And he said, that, he says, I drooped around here for two or three weeks. And he says, I think, well, I ain't got nothing to lose. I'll just borrow enough to buy me another car load. And he says, I did. He says, I got out and borrowed the money. They let me have some more money. And he said, uh, he sent it and says, it went right the other way. And he says, since that time, he says, I've lost on several cars of ship. He says, don't hurt so bad and they don't take all you got. And he says, now you'll find it right where you lost it. Go back up there and buy you another. I said, buy nothing. I said, I ain't got nothing to buy with. Oh, he says, uh, they'll let you have money. If you work, he says, you can get the money. And he says, you go back up there and tell Mr. Hunt. That's when says, he'll give you a cut. So I did. I took him his word. I went up there. There's a good grand in this part. Looked after that Elk Creek Lumber Company. And as he cut that bounder from 3700 to 27 Cut this $1,000 off of it. And you're supposed to pay a third down, the place paying a third down and paid three hundred dollars. That the boy have a bit of <laughs> <laughs> And so I went ahead and went to work. And then that forty flood come. And I still had this old truck that had about wore out and put some tires on it. And it wouldn't get out of down in there. And I went back and told Mr. Hunt, I says, I'm ahead on my timber. I says, I paid you for more than I've got out. And I'll, I'll just have to turn it back over too because I can't make them payments this winter. Oh, he says, that'll be all right. I'll take care of that. He says, when can you pay? I says, well, it'll be up in May, I guess. And he says, well, go ahead, he says, and get out enough to pay your men and, and pack up all of his can. He says, it's going to get better. Well, I'd, I'd done that. And in less than a year from then, I had bought two new trucks, <laughs> and I didn't owe nobody a dime. I'd even paid off for the land at home. That's amazing. And I don't, I never didn't know where that money come from. But I worked day and night. You were talking about your dad going to the MML Hash in Johnson City. Mm -hmm. I'd saw all day in loads and loads of lumber. And I'd be over there the next morning at 7 o'clock when they went to work. And I'd come back and I'd get back by 9 or 9.30. And I'd saw again after not to go again the next one. I'd leave home about, oh, it'd be around four o'clock, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, and many a time you'd left at three, and they fix your breakfast before you go. Saw Millen, saw Millen, Miller's wife's a hard job for both of it, isn't it? I think it has been. We've been a hard working family. Well, y'all have done so well, and I know saw Millen was such a big thing in our county, too, and around about. And 
And then when the sun to come, we know nothing but get ready and go to church. Uh,